to everyone who is joining. Hi, welcome. Um, we're super excited for the session. And yeah, maybe just, oh, there you go. I say this here. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, I'm so happy to be here today with our incredible panelists. Um, I'm Palpana. Uh, I'm a technologist, climate activist, and urban gardener. I'm also the founder of Nowadays on Earth, which is a social enterprise advocating for contact with nature in the digital age and growing environmental justice. I'm also your host this afternoon for our talk on nature connection in the digital age. And we will have some time at the end for questions. So you can place those in the box next to the chat feature. Um, so let's get started, let's dig in. Um, to set the tone for the conversation, uh, today we're living in an age of rapid urban and technological growth in which systems of extraction and pollution have pulled the global population from Earth's rhythms and has really created a culture that's headed for climate and social collapse. And yet we're finding that story, social knowledge and practice is becoming an emergent strategy in forming intercultural resistance through myth-telling. So today we're joined by activists, writers, foragers, and gardeners to consider how myth-telling and technology can help us restore our connection to nature and envisage uh, an alternative future, a radical world where all species can flourish. So I'd love the three of you to introduce yourselves and we'll start with Isaias. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. I'm calling here in um, Los Angeles. It's, uh, I'm meeting seven in the morning. Um, my name um, is Isaias. I also am an environmental justice educator. I'm based in the United States. Um, I created um, Queer Brown Vegan, which is an independent uh, environmental media platform that seeks to improve the discourse around climate literacy. So a lot of my work actually looks into focusing and highlighting um, local climate solutions and working alongside those intersections to actually um, include cultural resiliency in those narratives in which we talk about climate solutions. So thank you so much again for having me. And Days, on to you. Hello, uh, I'm Days. What, what do I do? Um, <laughs> a question that always like throws me off. Um, but it, long and short is a lot of my work is basically revolving around environmental justice. And what that looks like is very different on a daily basis, whether it's content creation and narrative work and communications work, working with, you know, broadcasters about how do we communicate the climate crisis, right around to working in more like creative outputs like art and theatre and cultural spaces, um, as well as doing a lot of the on the ground work, especially around land justice, mythology and folklore, um, and getting people to learn how to connect with the land in order to inspire action. Um, and at the moment, that's taken me to an artist in residence at a local nature reserve in East London. Um, and that's like one of my favorite outputs of my environmental activism at the moment. Hi, um, I'm Emma. Uh, I also hate this question because I find it quite hard to describe myself, but I would describe myself as a storyteller rebuilding a relationship with Earth and hopefully taking people along on that journey with me. Ultimately, I am a resource builder, a content creator and a, a writer of articles for various environmental clients and publications. My main area of interest is the intersection between people and the land, be it through land stewardship, uh, regenerative farming, indigenous land stewardship and indigenous food cultures. Um, what else? I work with clients such as Earthrise, Paternity, Sugi, talking about forestry, talking about patterns. And I'm really excited to chat to you all more about storytelling and its importance. Uh, amazing, super exciting. Yes, I think we love to hate that existential question. Who am I? And I feel like I'm asking myself that every single day and I always get a different answer. Um, so to start us off, I'd like to um, start with a quote by Charles Einstein from his uh, book, Climate, A New Story. We never were separate from nature and never will be, but the dominant culture on earth has long imagined itself to be apart from nature and destined one day to transcend it we have lived in a mythology of separation. So let's begin, I say as, as an environmental justice educator and activist whose work centers on building ecological knowledge among communities, 
what role have you seen storytelling play in connecting us back into nature? And can you share some examples with us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think for a lot of people, um, and this is actually a really great way to kind of imagine it is how much um, the dominant society within capital structures have really drained ecological wealth. So there's this image that was shown um, to young students. It was a paper and it, it wasn't divided into two. It had five plant species on the left and five brand logos on the right. All the kids were able to answer five brand logos and all the kids were not able to answer barely any plant species. So what, what it's showing not so much is that, oh my God, the kids are not, they're not smart. It means about, of how much we've been centering um, these types of um, non-human entities that are necessarily polluting and damaging the earth and not actually realizing what is actually beneficial, what is true wealth to our society. And so when I started, you know, one way I kind of participated take into this and learning about local knowledge is um, when I got into foraging a few years ago and from like one of my teachers that is indigenous to the land um, was teaching me about how much we need to be able to enter the land with curiosity rather than interrogation and to consume and to take everything for what it is um, and to actually sit down and actually talk to the land. And I was realizing that many of the ways in which children are growing up in today's society is how much we um, tease them for hugging a tree, tease them for talking to the soil, um, tease them for talking to animals or to fungi or to flora, or the fauna, whatever we may call it. And I, I think for me, that was a way for me to actually start to realize that how do I reframe my idea for protection and reframe it to have reverence, to have deep respect for the land because the land doesn't necessarily, and this is many indigenous communities have said this, like it doesn't need protection, it just needs you to respect it. Um, and, I, and I think for me, one of the things I do as, a, as an environmental educator is how much I think a lot of us are really great at problem identification in being able to look at issues and say, this is what's wrong with the climate crisis. This is what's wrong with this issue. And I know how to identify these sectors. Um, but one of the one of my favorite scholars that I really like and how I incorporate this work of hope is realizing about evidence-based hope is that we need to be able to actually look at local climate solutions that are actually instilling those narratives of the raw oppression of individuals that have been able to actually connect with the landscape by creating climate resiliency plans. And I like to say that hope is a muscle for climate action because it is true when I actually talk about this in my work and realizing that there is this cultural and multidimensional perspective in climate solutions, not so much this technocratic solution of like, this is how much capital was put into this carbon capture money, money or money machine, you actually look into this local solution that was used from indigenous knowledge and how it revitalized the community. And so when I add this cultural aspect of my experiences being Latin from um, Mexico and being able to uh, connect with the land there, I I really hope to kind of inspire individuals is that we're missing this cultural, religious and spiritual aspect in a lot of our works in terms of how we are able to see issues and realize that, you know, both can coexist in terms of the Western science models and the indigenous science models and how we kind of unpack those um, ecologies that are trying to be unlocked. Um, and yeah, I would say that, you know, that personal story is what really gives individuals the power and the agency to kind of give themselves the autonomy to take initiative. That's such a wonderful um, point. And thank you for bringing up um, the, the notion of generational amnesia, because that has such an impact in the way that um, local solutions and grassroots initiatives that, you know, solutions that we have already to kind of solve the climate crisis are already existing. And yet we need to platform these narratives, platform these stories and, and give, redistribute that power back into those communities. Um, Days, you've been exploring that power within communities and um, sort of the, the ways that art and gardening and foraging can help you discover personal myths and stories. So can you tell us a little bit about that process and to what extent you found belonging in nature through those practices? Mm, I think I'll start with the latter end of that question because it it made me realize how important nature connection is in solving the climate crisis. Um, for myself, it started when I was younger. I grew up in London, in Tottenham, which is an area that's like 
known for quite a lot of gang violence and poverty. Um, and that was like my everyday reality. But in my teens, I ended up moving to the countryside um, and ended up finding a relationship with nature. And for me, it was this recognition of the safety that I felt in nature that I had never felt anywhere else. And that was the beginning of my connection. And that was the beginning of me learning how reciprocal nature's relationship with us is, you know, and in honor to honor that, as Isaiah said, is it's this like level of having respect for, but then also giving back to and recognize it as an equal exchange of being a giver and a receiver without earth. And that's kind of like my journey. Um, and then going forward, I started working on regenerative cultures work, which is basically the, I always call it like, it's something that means everything and nothing all at the same time. Um, but it's this focus on how do we match regeneration and the need for connection in order to actually help save our planet for us. Um, and it's about recognizing non-human life forms as something that holds equal value to us. It's by recognizing future generations um, and ancestors as well um, and it's by seeing this as like a holistic thing of in order to help earth we have to learn how to treat each other well and this kind of took me through this kind of understanding I was also studying history at university at the same time and learning about the enclosures which in the UK was a time of where the elites took land from the common people and created a level of disconnect that ended up not just affecting people who are indigenous to England's land and their connection to nature, but ended up going global and basically being colonialism. And in order to really like look at the ways that we can address this is by one, learning how to tell these stories and learning how to connect to these stories too. And I think that's the place where folklore and mythology kind of comes into play. It's by learning how to connect back to these forgotten stories, these forgotten narratives. Um, that has led us to being where we are. So we know the roots of our problem. So we're able to address it from there. But then also it's about learning how do we not just acknowledge what's happened, but actively fight against it? How do we do the opposite of what's already happened? And this is in that space of how do we end up learning how to love the land again? Um, and I went through a journey of where I was in the countryside, but not everyone does that and not everyone moves to the countryside. So when I came back to London, a like a large part of my work was how do I get people in London to connect with nature, to know how to love nature, to know how to know nature? Um, to create this like sense of true belonging and interdependence. And this is where the things like foraging started because it was a lovely way of being like in the middle of London, but then also being able to identify plants to whether it's, you know, to eat them or not to eat them. <laughs> um, and learning how do you build relationships with all living life? Um, and then in turn, it's led me to work in the nature reserve where I help teach these skills to other people. Um, and I think what I'm finding really interesting now, it's this connection between what we know is like the old ways of learning how to build nature connection like foraging like gardening right round to the newer ways of whether it's like one of my friends Joyce Lynn who uses indigenous AI in order to help mitigate against a lot of the logging that's happening in Africa and it's like these are the new solutions that are going to take us into a place of where we can really tackle the climate crisis both by respecting the technologies of the earth but then also by respecting what we can bring to it too and building that like mutually beneficial relationship again yeah that's really beautiful and um you really captured me with the sort of futurism ai whilst also you know making sure that the future is also indigenous uh, which is super important in bringing you know our own human narrative back into the ecosystem and shifting from you know um how do we do less harm to actually like how can we have a, a positive and reciprocal relationship with nature and with the earth? Um, Emma, you share direct experiences of humanity's dependence on its ecosystems through food and gardening that really highlight the importance of our relationship with the land. So can you elaborate on how stories themselves can help us have more contact with the natural world? So I think this is a really interesting question because I think we've really forgotten the power of storytelling and myth-telling. I feel like we live in a capitalist Western society where we're very driven by reason, data, and fact. But stories can help us make sense of the world and the meaning within it. They're much more complex than just saying X equals Y or one plus one is two. 
storytelling in particular, myth telling allows us to reanimate the natural world and put the magic back in it. And when you add magic, mystery and uncertainty, the world becomes unknowable. And I feel like we've become quite arrogant in the fact that we assume we know everything when really we understand very little and we are constantly underestimating our inhuman kin. So I feel like storytelling allows us to connect with the magic and the mystery of the world again. Uh, and I think through that, we are able to honor it and, and show gratitude and reverence. I currently thinking, I'm currently thinking that a lot of the news around the climate crisis is kind of shared as terrifying information, facts and figures. And I think that's very unemotional. I think it's quite hard to connect with the data and the science. Uh, I was recently working on a newspaper with All Birds and Earthrise Studio on the role of storytelling and the imagination. And I spoke to Sal Spellman and he said that he believes behavior change starts with the story. I think if you give people facts and figures, they're not gonna have an emotional reaction. But if you give people a story, especially one with hope, it, it inspires direction, action more. Um, I think it's really important to show the communities who are working towards solutions. And that's kind of what I try to do with my work is, is show the hope and show the focus and show the solution. Um, I think specific stories can provide a needed focus. Um, I think uh, everything seems quite mind boggling at the moment and sometimes stories provide that focus. I also think storytelling is all about using our imagination and ultimately imagination is what will help us create a better world, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, no, I think those are really wonderful points to bring up because um, I think especially in a very Western led anthropocentric society we're very we're very much conditioned and taught to move away from words like mystery and magic mm. because they're sort of out there and then they don't make sense to the rational mind and yet you know to Deus's point earlier we have to move beyond the sort of intellectual understanding of data and science and understand that that deeper intelligence that's within us and within our own knowing um, and take information from there. So I say as coming back to you, um, you often use technology to mediate experiences in nature for your community. So can you tell us a little bit about building kinship with the human and the non-human world through technology and how it might better help us forge deeper connections with the earth? Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, you know, I think, you know, prime, my primary work is just grounded a lot in social media. Um, but one of the things I really love to do is actually teach about history and heritage. I think for in the United States, there's a lot of Black and Indigenous and people of color that their histories have been stolen. And when you look at the dominant environmental movement in the U.S., it's predominantly white. And so a lot of people of color already don't see themselves in those spaces and don't think I'm not an environmentalist because I don't have these cert certain type of dominant experiences in which a lot of rhetoric is told. And so I try to kind of disrupt those narratives and say, you know, these are words that you should be knowing because this is what's going to validate your own existence and validate the thoughts that you were thinking. When I learned about the environmental justice movement here in the United States, I think I was 17 or 18 at the time. And I said, I didn't know there was Black and Indigenous people who were doing this. And now I feel like I've learned about all of these racist white environmentalists that don't, didn't never really cared about people of color. And so I saw myself as a way, as a young child at the time to kind of give that information back to younger people so they don't ever have to question themselves to say, should I ever be in this space and say, no, my heritage has always existed beyond these spaces and will continue to be existing in these spaces to help contribute to the justice um, oriented solutions. And I think, you know, one of the things that I realized is how and this is what we talked about previously, Kafan, is that, you know, uniformity is one of the greatest destructors on earth in, in terms of how it rejects this diversity of thought. And if we're not able to actually give ourselves how much diverse culture languages, um, the way that we speak to each other, the way that we interact, the way that our clothes tell, tell stories, um, you know, we're, we're, we're missing out on those relationships to actually connect not just with ourselves, but to actually connect with the land, because everything that is being said right now is interrelated to the whole. So, um, you know, I, I love to say that, you know, exploring my heritage and 
being able to actually share with other people through my personal experiences has given the agency for other folks to actually realize that, you know, there is this type of um, resistance that has been happening. Um, and, and I think with social media, it's yes, there's a lot of um, nuances to take. It's not it's both good and bad, right? It, it has its negative side effects on mental health, too. Um, but I'm, I think that it, it is a part of the solution now, which how we operate as a society because of how much we've not advanced, but how much culture has shifted within those narratives. Um, and I like to say, you know, as the temperatures rise, so does the resistance and movement. So who are, who are we to say that, um, you know, we're not connected to the land anymore? I think it's more about um, there's, there's been this... Um, lost knowledge but that's not to say that we were never connected because i think for a lot of us that grew up as young people we love to run around the grass we love to actually touch things we like to i mean some kids would eat soil or like you know i wouldn't do that but for me but you know like some you know some people were you know experiencing the outdoors doing things or realizing that you know even if you go outside and you live in a concrete jungle and this is something we talked about a of years ago it's like that concrete that stone is made out of minerals it's made out of a living system that is part of earth that was naturally formed and so there's so much things in which we really disregard of ourselves of saying you know i'm not touching nature but it's like the water you drink is alive water is a living system so um reminding ourselves about those small things is helpful yeah, thank you for, for sharing that. And I love what you said about, you know, everything has a story. And I think um, it's really interesting the way that, you know, technology continues to evolve as well to tell those stories from various perspectives that are not human perspectives in order to really include um, nature's voice in those spaces without, you know, anthropomorphizing, you know, what they might be thinking or saying and, you know, just creating a whole culture that, isn't supportive to actually helping the climate move on from it. Um, Emma, speaking of stories, <laughs> can you help us contextualize our role within, um, sorry, let me start over again. How do stories help us contextualize our role within the ecosystem? And do you think that technology has opened up a new dimension of storytelling in order to empower communities to take action? Well, following on from what Isaiah said, I think technology has really given us access to the stories of the indigenous people who have a direct relationship with the natural world. And I feel like they're the real environmental storytellers of this earth that we haven't yet to give them the platform that they deserve. Um, in The Great Derangement, I don't know if you've heard of it by Amitif Ghosh, he talks about how Western culture is wrapped up in individualistic thinking, self-expression and personal development. For example, if you look at the building's Roman novel, and this perspective makes it very hard to communicate about the collective, um, let alone the earth itself. So for example, we don't see from a bird's eye, we don't see from a river's perspective. And we, in our Western culture, are currently not creating narratives from this perspective, but indigenous communities are. So I feel like if we are to contextualize ourselves as part of an ecosystem, we need to change the narrative of our stories. We need to stop seeing the world just from our eyes and we need to see it from, from the our inhuman kin, from, from the landscape itself. Um, in terms of my work, I work with uh, a brand called Paternity, who is a creative studio that works on collaborative projects, workshop talks and products uh, centered around the positive power of pattern. So pattern is kind of the universal language of the cosmos. It shows that we are all interconnected and we explore how humans have developed toxic patterns that are at odds with nature's patterns. So instead, we look to nature to see how we should be living, for example, living with a circle in mind, allowing for decay, death rest and rebirth rather than just doing, doing and taking and taking. Um, so when looking at these stories, I'm not saying this is what nature means. I'm kind of taking what nature is showing me. I'm allowing nature to provide the narrative and I'm listening. Um, while I think technology is allowing us access to all these stories and the ability to animate them in a really creative way, I've actually been thinking a lot about the limitations of technology, such as social media, especially Instagram. I feel like social media has been really set up to pedestal the individual. Um, and I feel like to be successful on the platform, you kind of need to, to center yourself. And I think that's obviously because it's being created in, in a kind of patriarchal um, landscape. And I feel... 
Instagram kind of makes it quite hard to communicate around the collective or collective thinking and action. And so I'd really love to imagine like new social media or networking platforms that really allow the collective to speak for itself. Um, so I guess it's good and bad about technology there. <laughs> No, I love that. I think it's really important to critically think about the systems and the tools that we're using in order to really create these worlds that we want to live in. And um, yeah, I think something really powerful that you said there about um, giving uh, technology, at least giving the ability to um, indigenous communities to share those stories at scale um, within these platforms, but then also critically thinking about how those platforms might be impacting the message through algorithms and you know, different AI and policies. Um, so I think this is a good point to kind of touch on with you, Days, in order to really uproot that sort of seediness of techno-capitalism and begin building regenerative cultures. Um, in my opinion, I think we need complete policy regulation and tech design and for it to be circular so that it can actually really uphold both the rights of people and nature. Um, so what steps um, do you think we should take in order to ensure that progress demands justice? Mm, yeah, definitely. I think policy plays such an important part. I, I didn't mention, but I did run for um, parliament a couple of years ago um, in order to kind of get people to recognize how we can do politics differently. Um, and a project that I'm currently working on with a friend, um, which is about how do we bring imagination policy like activism into politics, into policy design. And I think that's kind of where it is. It's how do we get people to imagine beyond? And I love the parts of where Isaiah was talking about things like play and connecting with inner children, because that's something I do with policymakers um, as part of my consultancy practice, which changes their perception of how they design policy. But in turn, it's about bringing the sexiness and the allurement of the world that we're living in now. Um, when we talk about mitigating against climate crisis and doing things that are in service to the environment a lot of the time we look so far back that we don't know how to look forward and looking forward does look like including technology in many different ways whether it's social media right round to um ai and like a whole bunch of web3 and dows and there's there is so much excitement right um so it's like how do we bring these kind of more more like new ways into it, but looking at it through a lens of policy as well. Um, and I think the more practical stuff is bringing community back into policy design, which is something that doesn't happen very often. A lot of the time policy is created sort of like very separately to community and to nature. But when you build a whole society that is based on love and care for the environment and then bring them into the places that we create policy, whether that's encouraging young people to participate meaningfully in parliament re elections and gaining from their knowledge and openness to see the world in a different way, right round to having like open spaces to really bring democracy truly back to the people's hands and using that as the basis information for policy design. There are many different ways that we can start looking at it, but I do think having nature connection and technology at the core of like the policies that we're going to be living by in the future is the only way that we can go forward. I, oops, got a notification. Um, I really love that because um, I think something that I always speak to nowadays is um, this idea of being able to embrace both our humanness with our its creativity and ingenuity along with the fact that our bodies are a part of nature itself. And to really kind of step into that future, we need to embrace both those identities instead of like keeping them at arm's length and apart because um, we've got different narratives being thrown at us about who we are and what to believe. So um, something that I'd love to ask the three of you are, what are some of the practical steps that everyone can take today to imagine and create a more radical landscape where all species can flourish and whoever wants to go first can start? Uh, I'll, go, I'll go first <laughs> and I'll, I'll still the Robin Wall Kimmerer quote, which she talks about if you want to develop a relationship with the earth, um, start by building like creating a garden and I would say that I in order to rebuild a relationship with the earth and imagine a new future I think growing your own food is a really great place to start because it allows you to enter into a, a very obvious two-way relationship where 
you are taking care for something and you are receiving something in return but only if you give back will you will you get something in return and I think that message of the fact that we need to give back in order to to get something is is a very important one and I think that can be achieved through gardening Yeah, um, sorry, I really struggle with this question because I think there's so many ways. Um, I, I think for just the general individual, it's like, you know, continue doing what you are doing in your own aspects, but add that environmental and ecological component is that, you know, I, I think in the environmental movement, we've become so obsessed with certain green lifestyles, whether it's like you're vegan or you're car free or you're plane free. And you know, I think it's all great to be reducing those things and, you know, saying like no to these like mechanistic systems that are sometimes not ecologically aligned to your values or who you are as an individual. Um, but I, I really think that, you know, the best way that you actually challenge yourself to actually become better to the land is actually visiting and talking to trees, talking to the grass. Like, actually, you know, I tell my friends this and they always laugh at me sometimes, but then they, they agree is that, whenever I just like want to talk about my day but then I don't have anyone to rant to I just go outside and just talk to the tree and like obviously like you know at, you know at first it seems a bit kind of weird for individuals because you're like oh well why are you talking to tree but it actually helps a lot like you know I, I realize how beneficial that has been for me and then I hug the tree after because I say thank you for listening um, and I stay there too to just say like what they're up to. But you know, I, I think that's one like one of the easiest ways for you to just like recognize that you actually are talking and actually taking naps in the outdoors or in the forest with friends too. Like don't you want to make sure you're safe too, of course. Um, you know, that has been really beneficial for me to help, you know, not you know, connect directly in nature, but start to understand like, wow, it's not so scary to be outside. Wow, it's not so scary to actually recognize that there is another living entity that's right, that's next to me. And I just, you know, want to be able to listen more to it. Thanks. And um, I'll share mine. Hopefully, I think days will come up magically. <laughs> um, I think one of the, one of the things that, um, I personally love doing is um, listening to my internal ecosystem and really kind of grounding into my body and seeing the relationship between the outer ecosystem and my inner ecosystem and how they're both interacting. Um, because there's, you know, as I say, as just mentioned, there's there's always a conversation, there's always a dialogue, there, there are always stories being told. And I think the question to kind of really tune into is, are we listening? Um, and a, a big part of actually, I think taking action is, is listening, um, not just to our communities, um, but also like our non-human communities and the you know the, our microbe communities within our bodies and what they have to tell us um are, are really key messages um i think that will lead us to the solutions but also the actions um because the solutions that you know for me anyways i feel like the solutions are there um and the ability to act will be inspired through listening um so Yes, I don't know if we're going to have Dace jump in at any point, but if she does, we'll, we'll come back around to her. Um, I'm going to take it back to our audience, uh, who I see are very active on the chat, so thank you. <laughs> and I'm going to start asking our panelists for um, the questions that you've all typed in. Um, please feel free to keep uh, sending questions through the Q&A box um, from Aurora. Do the panelists have any advice for engaging more diverse audience on nature and climate crisis and creating more welcoming and inclusive spaces, whether online or in our communities? I say yes. Oh, hi, Days. <laughs> okay, maybe, <laughs> maybe so before we start. Yes, no, no worries. Was nature. <laughs> <laughs> Mercurial internet waves today. Um, before we start with the question of the days, I've, I've just asked um, if you have any sort of practical steps that you want to share with anyone on imagining and creating a radical landscape around us so that all species can flourish. 
Mm, I think, yeah, it actually reminds me. So I recently contributed to a, a publishment from Tate um, and it was it, it was an ex exhibition actually called Radical Landscapes. And it was talking about how do we kind of bring in the knowledge of the land and create like a new form of nativity. Um, and it kind of reminds me of the quote um, from one of my friends, Jay Griffin. If you don't know her, she's an amazing nature writer. And she talks about how building indigeneity is so important, especially for diaspora communities, communities that have been uprooted and have landed somewhere else in the world. There is something about getting to know the land and then in turn becoming native to the land. Um, and she talks about how nativity is based on knowing um, and kind of creating that relationship of really knowing and building a relationship with the land. And I think that's the beginning of everything. It's how do you learn how to love the land so deeply that we actually grieve and grieve deeply for the loss that's going on so we can find the strength in that anger that we hold and that love that we hold in order to fight for our climate fight for our environment and I think yeah that's like the tangibility I know it's like it's not it's not the most tangible but it is a very practical thing is how do we root every action we take in love care and duty to our earth to ourselves to all things that hold consciousness um and I think that's like the everyday thing and if you do that like everything would be amazing <laughs> in essence <laughs> I love that yeah I really resonate with um with rooting, deeply rooting into sort of the locality of whatever space you reside in, because especially like in this very global digital age, like we're everywhere and nowhere at once. So, you know, it becomes really an existential practice and uh, uh, yeah, very beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, <laughs> so the, the question from our audience that uh, um, if anyone wants to share, but I think I say this, this one might be a good one for you to answer. Um, any advice for engaging more diverse audiences on nature and climate crisis and creating more welcoming and, and inclusive spaces, whether online or um, on the ground? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think for any event building and, you know, I talk more of my younger years when I used to do this is that you need to have food like and the food needs to be good. I mean, I I've honestly have been to events where I'm like, even they had some vegan food. and I said, oh, my God, like this is disgusting like I mean I'm thankful for the food I'm not trying to be ungrateful but I was like I should have just brought my own food and I think food and culture is really embedded in actually creating that safe boundary with an individual saying like wow I feel safe I feel taken care of already that they have food and they have water or drinks for me um, to consume so I feel hydrated and the second thing is actually um, you know, in trying to create these safe spaces for people of color, I think it is important that there is this history and acknowledgement, but there has to also be this active acknowledgement um, with this, with the, with the landscape and the environment and um, those people is that, um, you know, we may be upholding to oppression and racism still. Um, and, I, and I think that to me, you know, when I hear, you know, white people tell me they're, they're recovering racist, you know, uh, to me, that is very, it's very surprising that they say that um, to me because I'm like, okay, well, that acknowledges, you know, the power dynamics that are already set in this conversation. But I think it is important that we do we do come with this active mind of anti-racism because I've been to environmental events that are for, you know, diversity, but you start to ask, well, for who to whom exactly is this diverse audience really for, right? Like, I, I don't really like to go with these high level events, I like to stay local. So in my community, I think it's about actually realizing like if you're not bringing music, if you're not bringing dancing, if you're not bringing um, laughter into these spaces, then it's not going to be a very safe and welcoming space. I think you need to ensure that you're going to be building that and actually partnering with other orgs that are locally in that area so they don't also then they also get accredited for the work that they've been doing in those areas because i've definitely um have been in spaces where they don't really talk about these other orgs because there's this competition about well we need the funding and we need this but the truth is like you know the other nonprofits aren't stealing funding from each another it's a system that has designed us uh to play against each other so i would say you know actively practicing anti-racism is actually looking about how can you constantly give back to a community rather than thinking about yourself about, well, what if, how can I make this experience best? It's like, what are you going to do right now to, you know, those actions? So, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I love that. Um, and 
I think there's something really powerful to be said about like creating a space and, and injecting it with joy because that's a part of the resistance. Um, from Allison, it's, uh, oh, <laughs> firstly, it's absolutely lovely for me to turn on this session and see four young faces speaking so eloquently on the environment. I think that's a massive thank you from all of us. <laughs> and the question, the people with, um, with levers are generally old white men. Do you have any insight as to how to engage them in nature connection in the digital age? Days, you might have a few <laughs> answers for that. <laughs> because um, so I found myself um, figuring out how I can be an activist and raise income so I can do the work that I do for the communities that can't pay me for free. Um, and one way was to work with corporates, which I know is very strange and uncomfortable for a lot of activists. Um, but this kind of leads me to white old men with power. Um, <laughs> and a lot of the time I tend to work with um, like global corporations who are serious about climate action and who aren't there to greenwash, aren't there to like exploit, but are there to really know and feel supported in the journey of trying to find their way to be better. Um, and that takes me to the work that I do. So I do a lot of stuff around climate strategy work, quam strategies, everything around there. But the first part is actually nature connection. Um, so I take these mostly like anywhere between 40 to 70 year old white men into the forest for them to really learn how to connect with nature and learn to love nature and connect back with their own. Um, and I think there is something that's really beautiful about this like unorthodox thing of how do we bring nature back into the workplace? How do we bring nature back into unconventional spaces of where she's talked about, but she's not really engaged with. Um, and I think there is something that's really beautiful in that end, but then also it's, helping people to be able to connect with nature again but then also recognizing that they shouldn't be the the holders of power as well and I think that's also a conversation that comes in a lot of the time too about how do we end up giving back power how do we end up letting go and surrendering um to whether it's the youth or the indigenous peoples or black and brown people and making sure that this is an active effort in it as well because in order to really be able to mitigate against climate change we have to address the root problem of the issues and the root problem is cultures of disconnection and exploitation that usually affects black and brown people young people indigenous people working class people more um so in order to really actually be you know connecting to nature to be trying to mitigate against climate crisis and environmental disaster we have to do that work too that's deeply uncomfortable and it's about surrendering power and making sure that the old white men know they shouldn't be there and start to create transition plans to hand over power to the people who should be holding it Yes, <laughs> just a resounding yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I think if anyone has any um, points or recommendations on books or reading for connecting people with nature, please add them to the chat box. We have like a minute left, so I want to move on to the next question, um, which is, uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. okay, how do we bring uh, First Nations knowledge and Indigenous people's knowledge to mainstream societies and cultures? And how do we prioritize this kind of knowledge and also celebrate it? Happy to, anyone for, to jump in, please do. <laughs> oh, I think I'll, I'll go for first. Um, I think one thing, that I, I'm fascinated by is like exploring like the expansion of indigenous as a word. Um, usually we're focused, when, when we think indigenous, we think of people living in the Amazon, people living in South America, but in actuality, there is indigenous cultures all across the world. Some have been lost and forgotten, some are in full stride and haven't really been given the space due to the patriarchal racist system that we live within. Um, I kind of come from this from a very weird way of, I am from a tribe in Nigeria called the Ibo people, the Onyoma people of the Niger Delta. Um, and we faced a lot of ecological disaster because of the area that we're from is very rich in oil. Um, so it's like a magpie for a lot of Western nations. Um, but one thing I've learned is by listening to the folklore of that land, but also combining it with the understanding of the folklore of the UK, which is something I've learned 
to create belonging for myself in a country that was born in that I've lived in but always have never felt really truly connected to um, and in that kind of journey and exploration I figured that a lot of cultures actually end up prioritizing and loving the same things um, deeply when we start to look at its own indigenous storytelling um, and whether that's like for example the goddess of earth in like Ibo folklore which is Aja or Ella and she is the goddess of creativity of rejuvenation of birth and death and life um, but then also you find the same archetypal characters all across different folklores from the Greek right round to um, English folklore right round to folklores in you know Asia as well um, so it's about like connecting all of those and seeing indigeneity as something much more broader than just the traditional First Nations um, but then also being able to tap in to the place that you're currently situated and see the kind of parallels that make us human and see that kind of like human storytelling, um, like ecology that we see globally and seeing the connections and where we overlap and what we can learn from all of that. Mm, I think that's a wonderful way to kind of start wrapping up the session. Um, unless Emma and I see you want to jump in, but... <laughs> um, but yeah, I think the importance of rerouting into place and rediscovering our myths in the spaces that we reside in um, is super important in making sure we are kind of adhering to our own indigeneity and being able to um, create a future that is for people and planet and the flourishing of nature. Um, I'm going to end with one of my favorite quotes by Bell Hooks, um, which is, to be truly visionary, we have to root our imagination in our concrete reality while simultaneously imagining possibilities beyond that reality. So just let that soak in to yourselves <laughs> and to your nerve endings and let that connect and flourish out to the rest of your communities. Thank you everyone for being here and thank you to all of my incredible panelists. Uh, please make sure you follow their work. Um, I think you can follow their details online through the Communicate event. Um, but yeah, just honestly, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to have this conversation and to share um, this experience with everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Kalpana, as well, for hosting us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you, everyone. Bye. <laughs>